things of men. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Well, these churches were Baptist, Christian Missionary Alliance, Assemblies of God, Evangelical Free. They were all evangelical churches that were based originally on the idea of preaching the gospel. Okay? And then Rick Warren's program comes in, and he's telling them, no, you've got to change this whole thing. People don't like pews. People don't like crosses. You've got to go out and find out what the average person in your neighborhood wants to do if they were going to come to church at all. And you've got to design a church that appeals to the unsaved out here. He drove the gospel out of more churches than anybody you can imagine. I did talk to Rick Warren, and he would deny that's what he did, but he did it. I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people um, that since I started writing on this topic, and they all said the same thing. Once Rick Warren's program came in, the gospel went out. Hymns about the blood and about the cross, they went out. Some, some cases, even the piano went out. I don't know that he set out to destroy the entire evangelical movement, but he pretty, did a pretty good job of doing it. The principles of self-esteem, felt needs, and personal fulfillment are also foundational to church growth. Robert Schuller wrote, the New Reformation will return our focus to the sacred right of every person to self-esteem. The fact is, the church will never succeed until it satisfies the human being's hunger for self-value. You feel better about yourself. Well, God's goal is not to make you feel better about yourself. I know this is going to sound terrible, but he isn't interested in self-esteem. He's interested in self-denial. George Barna, the evangelical counterpart to George Gallup, says, Ministry, in essence, has the same objective as marketing, to meet people's needs. Christian ministry, by definition, meets people's real needs by providing them with biblical solutions to their circumstances. Lee Strobel says, The most effective messages for seekers are those that address their felt needs. Rick Warren also says, It is my deep conviction that anybody can be one to Christ if you discover the key to his or her heart. It may take some time to identify it, but the most likely place to start is with the person's felt needs. While most unbelievers aren't looking for truth, they are looking for relief. This concept of felt needs is related to marketing research, being relevant, and satisfying the customer. If we can convince people that Christ died to meet their felt needs, they will buy our product. But can the church borrow the marketing tools of the world and apply them to the church? Unlike cheeseburgers or coffee, which may have great attraction to consumers, the gospel is foolish to the unsaved. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Notice how Jesus dealt with felt needs. At Capernaum, Jesus exposed the motives of the multitudes who followed him when he said, You seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Miracles in the New Testament point to the person and work of Christ, yet the multitudes sought Jesus because of their felt need of hunger, which according to Jesus was the wrong reason. He said, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Rather than meeting their felt needs, Jesus told them to believe on him, and they murmured, From that time, Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Bill Hybels decided that the felt need that deserved most attention was personal fulfillment. While Schuler redefines sin in relation to self-esteem, Hybels adds a pragmatic twist to the definition of sin as a flawed strategy to gain fulfillment. But Jesus does not guarantee fulfillment as a result of following him. In fact, the direct opposite is communicated when Jesus says, If you were of the world, 
the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Church growth, purpose-driven, and seeker-driven pastors are seeking to please men by giving them fulfillment, self-esteem, and meeting their felt needs. The Bible warns against this. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who tests our hearts. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be the bondservant of Christ. G. A. Pritchard also observes the psychological influence on Bill Hybels' Willow Creek Community Church. The psychological categories Hybels teaches, however, become fundamental categories for how Willow Creek Christians view themselves, their relationships, and life in general. Ironically, while Hybels is evangelizing those in the world toward Christianity, he is also evangelizing Christians toward the world. As the unchurched Harry in the audience, 10%, move closer to Christianity, the Christians in the audience, 90%, are often becoming more psychological and worldly. In Ladies' Home Journal, a secular magazine, Rick Warren wrote an article entitled, Learn to Love Yourself in March 2005. He told readers, To truly love yourself, you need to know the five truths that form the basis of a healthy self-image, which included accept yourself, love yourself, be true to yourself, forgive yourself, and believe in yourself. These are all pop psychology phrases and completely miss the mark of Jesus' teachings. While we are told to love others as we love ourselves, the scriptures also inform us that we already love ourselves in Ephesians 5, 28-29. We do not need to be encouraged in self-love that amounts to self-centeredness. In fact, the Bible declares self-love to be a sinful indication of the last days. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. A primary felt need of unbelievers is entertainment. These churches are designed much like theaters, complete with stadium seating, lighting and sound technicians, dance and drama performances in the sanctuary. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. Author G. A. Pritchard describes how Willow Creek is merely a continuation of the 1974 youth group Sun City. Former associate pastor Don Cousins explained that in many ways Willow Creek was an adult Sun City. Yet Sun City seemed to stretch the boundaries of youth ministry, writes Pritchard. Utilizing entertainment to appeal to unbelievers, the sanctuary was once decorated as a jail. Full-scale gymnastics were once used. They held the Hallowed Queen competition, where teenage boys came dressed in drag. Sun City's leaders explain, We are in the auditorium, and the windows are open, and the music is howling at ear-splitting decibels. There are flashing lights going all over the place with these big ambulance lights. There are kids literally bouncing off the walls, screaming at the top of their lungs. Everything that you would not think would be happening in a church sanctuary is definitely happening in a church sanctuary.
display of power because we have professional motocross racer Steve Dennis right here, right now. And Steve, show us what it's all about. Give him a welcome, guys. Think he can jump this? Cheer for him and see if he can do it. Come on now, get him going, get him going. Get him going. Woo, yeah. So I'm praying one morning. I'm like, God, how are we going to start this thing out? I'm in my basement. I got my iPod. I'm lifting weights. The song by ACDC, Highway to Hell, comes on. I said, that'll do it. <laughs> now, I know, I, know, I know you shouldn't listen to ACDC when you're working out, but I do, and it's awesome. We know that entertainment is a product of the world, the world's substitute for true joy, and has no place in the house of God. This movement is allowing the world to define the church, rather than letting the word of God define it. The Apostle Peter says, In regard to these, they, unbelievers, think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Peter said that we spent enough of our past lifetime in abominable idolatries of worldly entertainment and that we should no longer live the rest of our lifetime in the flesh. Nevertheless, entertainment is being brought into the church to appeal to unbelievers. thing though James that's the other thing we really do have a heart we, when we get together we don't just get together and go how can we piss a lot of people off <laughs> I know highway to hell that'll do it I mean we pray we seek the Lord we're asking we're begging for his direction it's not just me going I think I got a good shock effect thing this Easter it's we really come together with a purpose of what do we really feel that God wants us to do in this service Celebrity pastor Mark Driscoll of Mars Hill Church in Seattle explained his technique for achieving church growth by responding to the sexual lusts of the young students and singles within his congregation. I assumed the students and singles were all pretty horny, so I went out on a limb and preached through the Song of Songs in the fall. Each week I extolled the virtues of marriage, foreplay, oral sex, sacred stripping, and sex outdoors just as the book teaches because all scripture is indeed profitable. Driscoll also answered sexually explicit questions within the church. Is masturbation a legitimate form of birth control? See, I don't know what's coming, so I can't prepare for this. Now, on the subject of masturbation, I will say this. The Bible doesn't say anything. Masturbation is not a sin. Look how quiet it got. Can I do it? Can I do it? But Jesus never went into this sexually explicit detail. The Lord simply said, But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish and for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Driscoll also claims to have the gift of discernment, which allows him to see the sexual sins of his congregation. On occasion, I see things. I see things. Uh, like I was meeting with one person, and they, they didn't know this, but they were abused when they were a child. And I said, when you were a child, you were abused. This person did this to you, physically touched you this way. He said, how do you know? I said, I don't know. It's like I got a TV right here, and I'm seeing it. I said, no, that never happened. I said, well, go ask them. Go ask them if they actually did what I think they did, and I see that they did. And they went and asked this person, when I was a little kid, did you do this? And the person said, yeah, but you were only like a year or two old. How do you remember that? I said, oh, Pastor Mark told me. Okay. I'm not a guru. I'm not a freak. I don't talk about this. If I did talk about it, everybody would want to meet with me, and I'd end up like one of those guys on TV. But some of you have this visual ability to see things. Um, uh, there was one woman uh, I dealt with. She'd never told her husband that uh, she had committed adultery on him early in the relationship. 
I said, you know, she's sitting there with her husband. I said, you know, I think the root of all this, I think Satan has a foothold in your life because you've never told your husband about that really tall blonde guy that you met at the bar. And then you went back to the hotel. She's just looking at me like, I said, you know, it's about 10 years ago. See everything. She says, she looks at her husband. He says, is that true? She says, yeah. He was 6'2", blonde hair, blue eye. Yeah. Some of you, when you're counseling, you will see things. I mean, you will, you will literally, gift to discernment, see things. I can't even explain it. It doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes your counselee, they will see things. There's, I found this with people. I said, okay, now let me, I'm going to ask the demon questions. You tell me what they say. They don't say anything. It's like, what are you hearing? They said, nothing. They said, but I'm seeing stuff. I'm like, oh, oh, well, tell me, what's that? I'm seeing, you know, when I was little, my grandpa molested me. I didn't know that. I said, well, let's not assume it's true. Go ask your grandpa. Grandpa says, yeah, when you were little, I molested you. Grandpa was assuming they'd be too young to remember. So he'd only molest grandkids up until a certain age. But they saw it. It's a supernatural. It's, it's, it's the whole other realm. It's like the matrix. You can take the blue pill, you can take the red pill. You go into this whole other world. And, and, and that's the way it works. So I say, tell me everything you hear, tell me everything you see, and sometimes I see things too. I see things too. I've seen women raped, I've seen children molested, I've seen people abused, I've seen people beaten, I've seen horrible things done. Horrible things done. I've seen children dedicated in occultic groups and demons come upon them as an infant by invitation and I wasn't present for any of it, but I've seen it visibly. Upon occasion, when I get up to preach, I'll see, just like a screen in front of me, I'll see somebody get raped or abused, and then I'll track them down and say, look, I had this vision, let me tell you about it. All true. One I had, I was sitting in my office at the old uh, Earl building. This gal walks by, a nice gal, member of the church. This one of the church was small. And it was just like a TV was there, and I saw the night before, her husband threw her up against the wall, had her by the throat, was physically violent with her, and she said, that's it, I'm telling the pastors. And he said, if you do, I'll kill you. He was a very physically abusive man. She was walking by, and I just saw it. It's like a TV. I said, hey, come here for a sec. I said, last night, did your husband throw you up against the wall and have you by the throat, physically assault you, and tell you if you told anyone that he would kill you? And she just starts bawling. She says, how did you know? I said, Jesus told me. Call the guy on the phone. Hey, I need you to come to the office. Didn't give him any clue. Comes in. I said, dude, what'd you do to your wife last night? Why'd you do this? Why'd you throw up against the wall? And he gets very angry. They're sitting on the couch. He says, why did you tell him? I said, she didn't. Jesus did. Jesus did. Okay. And there are some people that have real gift of discernment, and I'm not saying I'm 100% always right with it, but some of you are going to have gift of discernment, and you need, to, you need to learn to grow in the use of that gift. And sometimes people will hear things, sometimes people will see things. In Mark Driscoll's book, Real Marriage, he advocates many unbiblical sexual practices for married couples. Driscoll is obviously an extreme in his sexual licentious preaching, but it nonetheless exemplifies the church growth principles of meeting felt needs. Depending on the felt needs of a congregation, in this case of Mars Hill being predominantly youthful and lustful, church growth practices end in worldliness. John the Apostle said, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. In seeking to please the world, these megachurches often mirror the world, even its debauched practices. For instance, the Harlem Shake was an internet craze in the form of a video which went viral in early 2013. Many people from all over the world uploaded their own similar performances of people dancing lasciviously in costumes accompanied with a short excerpt from the song Harlem Shake. <laughs> then many churches, such as Saddleback's high school ministry, uploaded their own Harlem Shake videos. Harlem 
Rick Warren describes how the purpose-driven or market-driven paradigm is a franchise system which any pastor can transfer to his church in order to replicate the same church growth results produced at Warren's Saddleback Church model. He says, Well, one of our values is what I call the good enough principle. A person doesn't have to be perfect for God to use them. Because we want our church to be a model for other churches, we want average people doing average activities in order to get extraordinary results. Just like how the typical McDonald's is able to succeed while being staffed by high school students. Because the system works, it doesn't require unusual talent. Thus, church growth principles may be practiced in any congregation to produce the same growing results of success. In fact, the conclusion of the church growth movement is that preaching should be judged by numerical results. McGavran says, In view of all this and much more evidence, must we not consider mission and intention a vast and purposeful finding? Is it possible biblically to maintain that only search is the thing? Motives are what matter. And the finding of multitudes of persons is something rather shabbily mechanical and success-ridden. Can we believe it theologically tenable to be uninterested in the numbers of the redeemed? Elevation Church unapologetically confesses that they are all about the numbers. Part of the Elevation Code says, We are all about the numbers. Tracking metrics measures effectiveness. We unapologetically set goals and measure progress through all available quantitative means. I have seen 426 people baptized over a span of three weeks in our church this past May. No, no, no. No, 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 no. That wasn't a sufficient, woo! Because you have to understand that our church had less than 20 people less than two years ago. This morning we'll meet in two campus locations, Providence High School and Porter Ridge High School in Union County. We'll have well over 2,500 people that will attend our worship experiences. Since February, we've seen 600 people give their lives to Jesus Christ. That includes 18 that gave their lives to Jesus this past Sunday. at our high school service called Pulse. And if you're new here, you're going, why are they clapping about the numbers? Is it all about the numbers? Excuse me. Yes! <laughs> yes, it's all about the numbers. Yes, it's all about the numbers. Consider how it was Satan who provoked David to number Israel, and the anger of the Lord kindled against Israel that moved David to number Israel. Certainly then God is disposed with the numbering of his church or basing the success of preaching upon numbers rather than faithfulness to the gospel. The Lord wants our trust to be in him alone and not in numbers. It is God who gives church growth, not according to the craftiness and wisdom of men, but according to his Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. It is the Lord alone that adds to the church such as should be saved. It is the conclusion of the church growth movement that God's will for every local congregation is numerical growth. In fact, Warren states, Forget church growth. Church health is the key to church growth. All living things grow if they're healthy. You don't have to make them grow, it's just natural for living organisms. But according to these church growth standards of numerical success and growth, many prophets of the scriptures would be considered the greatest failures of all time. Noah, for instance, preached for a hundred years and no one believed him. In the book of Revelation, Jesus never mentions church growth in his rebukes or his commendations of local churches. The two churches that were commended with no rebuke from the Lord Jesus were Smyrna and Philadelphia. Both of these churches were small, poor, lacking in influence, but were faithful to God. The church growth movement assumes that all numerical growth is good growth. Why should we assume that all growth is good growth? Quantitative or numerical growth is not the same as qualitative growth. In the end, 
Numerical growth justifies the various methods of church growth pragmatism. C. Peter Wagner agrees. We ought to see clearly that the end does justify the means. What else possible could justify the means? If the method I am using accomplishes the goal I am aiming at, it is for that reason a good method. The seeker-driven and purpose-driven churches are adding secular philosophy and pragmatism to the gospel, much like the Colossians to whom Paul wrote, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. If pragmatism is our guide, the church will be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Willow Creek released its findings of a multiple-year qualitative study of its ministry. With so many programs and activities in the church, Heibel said the results were earth-shaking and mind-blowing. But that survey just rocked my world. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to digest as a leader because some of the stuff that we have put millions of dollars in, thinking it would really help our people grow and develop spiritually, when the data actually came back, it wasn't helping people that much. Other things that we didn't put much money into and didn't put much, much staff against is stuff that our people are crying out for. Heibel's multi-million dollar organization, which has great influence on other church leaders, has proven unprofitable in regard to spiritual growth. Heibel's confessed. So Greg Hawkins, again, just brilliant guy. He goes, Bill, we've made a mistake. What we should have done at about this point, when people cross the line of faith, become Christians, we should have started telling people and teaching people that they have to take responsibility to become self-feeders. We should have gotten people... We should have gotten people, taught them how to read their Bible between services, how to do the spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own. The church growth principles utilize the wisdom of the world for its foundation rather than Christ. Paul specifically warned of the dangers of building the church upon foundations other than Jesus. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. In contrast to the attractiveness and craftiness of church growth leaders, it was said of Paul that his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. While Rick Warren says, we slander God's character if we preach with an uninspiring style or tone. The Apostle Paul said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The Apostle Paul's message was never determined by the felt needs of his audience. His message was always Christ crucified. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul refused to let anything compromise his simple gospel message. I think this uh, seeker-sensitive approach to ministry, because, because it's so obsessed with the idea of making Christ seem appealing or cool or making the gospel seem as easily embraceable as possible, uh, often all of the aspects of gospel truth that might be a stumbling block to someone have been deliberately removed. Everything's deliberately taken out so that there isn't 
anything about sin and repentance or the justice of God and the, the, the wrath of God against sin. And the effect of that then is to draw people to respond and to unite with the, the visible church who really have never been converted. They've never really confronted the reality of their guilt. They've never really trusted Christ for salvation from sin. They think they're following Christ because they're following the Christ that's been portrayed by these pragmatic ministers. And so they unite with the church, and the effect of it has been to fill the church with false converts, people who think they're Christians, who probably believe they are Christians, but they've never truly been converted. They've never left behind anything that they loved before. They've never really laid hold of the Christ of Scripture and loved him. Uh, and so they don't really believe him. And they're unbelievers who think they're believers, who call themselves Christians. And the church is filled today with people like that. And uh, so it's a, it's a mixed multitude. The celebrity pastors of the church growth movement give new meaning to turning the house of God into a marketplace. In John chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, Jesus found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Notice how Stephen Furtick's pulpit is surrounded with ads for his book, Crash the Chatterbox. Pastors like Furtick have used their non-profit pulpits to make a profit from books. Likewise, Mark Driscoll preaches with the logo of his book, Real Marriage, in the background. Celebrity pastors such as Furtick, Noble, and Driscoll have used tax-free money from their congregations to pay marketing firms to get their books on the bestseller lists. For instance, a company called Result Source Incorporated requires authors to make bulk purchases of their own books, then breaks those orders up into small increments to make them look like organic retail sales. World Magazine reported how Driscoll's Mars Hill Church paid at least $210,000 in 2011 and 2012 to ensure that his book, Real Marriage, made the New York Times bestseller list. Not only is this dishonest, it is an unethical use of God's resources in the church, but as a result, these celebrity pastors can call themselves best-selling authors for the rest of their careers. Though we don't read of Jesus being violent or hurting anyone, his actions were forceful against the merchandisers who set up shop in the place of worship. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Like the postmodern emergent church movement, the purpose-driven and seeker-sensitive organizations have generally promoted the spiritual disciplines of contemplative mysticism. One reason why these innovative market-driven pastors are promoting mysticism is because the world is looking for new ways to experience God. It's not just a matter of coming and sitting in a pew and enduring 50 or 70 or whatever minutes of, uh, of observing something happen. But it, it's, it's saying, I want to experience God. I'm interested in, in coming into an experience here. One leadership network study revealed that the fastest growing segment of the publishing industry were books on religion and spirituality. An outstanding trend is Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Another leadership network study says, why is mysticism re-emerging today? The emerging culture is less dependent upon a scientific and rationalistic way of thinking and has moved to a time when people want to experience God. On page 221 of The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren promotes spiritual disciplines he says, these character building habits are often called spiritual disciplines, and there are dozens of great books that can teach you how to do these. On page 126 of the Purpose Driven Church, Warren lists five major parachurch movements which seem to focus on a single purpose that he believes is valid and even helpful to the church. Among these, he listed what he called the Discipleship Spiritual Formations Movement 
Among the authors included in this movement, he listed Richard Foster and Dallas Willard, who underscored the importance of building up Christians and establishing personal spiritual disciplines. This spiritual formation movement promotes contemplative prayer through the spiritual disciplines. In the Christianity Today article called The Emergent Mystique, Emergent church leader Brian McLaren also named Richard Foster as one of the key mentors for the emerging church. Richard Foster and, um, and Dallas Willard, these guys are basically modern purveyors. And John Ortberg has picked up on all of this too. They're modern purveyors in, in what is centuries old Roman Catholic mysticism. And so the idea is, is that you can have a direct experience with God if you do such and such disciplines. Rick Warren actually aligns himself and promotes the contemplative prayer movement. In the book Rick Warren and the Purpose That Drives Him, the author responds, nowhere in Warren's book does he endorse, refer to, positively mention or dabble in contemplative prayer. However, we find irrefutable evidence of Warren promoting contemplative practices and endorsing other contemplative prayer teachers. In issue number 56 of Rick Warren's Ministry Toolbox, he recommends Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. The newsletter states, Foster was a disciple of Dallas Willard. This book is an excellent primer of the spiritual disciplines that lead to a deeper life with God. In Richard Foster's own words out of the same book recommended by Warren, he says, We should all without shame enroll as apprentices in the school of contemplative prayer. Christian contemplative prayer is kind of a misleading term because people that are unfamiliar with it would think that it had something to do with contemplating in the old sense of the word where you kind of think deeply on something. In essence, Christian contemplative prayer is about not thinking. It's employing a uh, word or phrase which is repeated over and over again for about 20 minutes. And you might ask, well, where did this come from? Well, it came from a group of mystics known as the Desert Fathers who lived in uh, North Africa and the Middle East in the early Middle Ages. And according to reliable sources, it says it was a time of great experimentation with spiritual methods. Many different kinds of disciplines were tried. Many different methods of prayer were created and explored by them. Created and explored by them. So this idea of using a uh, word or phrase chanted or repeated over and over again did not come from the Bible. It came from experimentation and development from these desert mystics. Brennan Manning was also quoted in Rick Warren's Ministry Toolbox. Manning is most well known for his book The Ragamuffin Gospel, which was once one of ten must-read books on the Saddleback family website. One of the major proponents of mysticism uh, in the church currently, uh, a man by the name of Brennan Manning, and he wrote a book called The Signature of Jesus, and he says if you do this kind of prayer, you'll have the signature of Jesus on your prayer life. So he says the first step in faith is to stop thinking about God at the time of prayer. Well, how can someone stop thinking about God? I mean, how is that the first step in faith? Well, the thing is, that is what mysticism is all about. You have to switch off your mind. You know, it's not intellectual. It's you're putting yourself in an altered state of consciousness. Then he says contemplative spirituality tends to emphasize the need for a change in consciousness. In other words, your awareness is, is totally uh, switched into another realm. We must come to see reality differently. And, he said, and how is this done? The following, choose a single sacred word, repeat the sacred word inwardly, slowly, and often. This is usually done for about 20 minutes. So you're just constantly saying this word or phrase over and over again for 20 minutes. Then he says, enter into the great silence of God. Alone in that silence will the noise within subside and the voice of love will be heard. So he's saying to really hear the word of God, you know, actual, not the Bible, not the word of God as far as the Bible goes, but to actually hear the word of God audibly, you have to go into this great silence of God to understand it. And that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with so-called Christian mysticism because these words and phrases are Christian in nature. Rick Warren also teaches this contemplative spiritual discipline in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, saying, The Bible tells us to pray all the time. How is it possible to do this? One way is to use breath prayers throughout the day, as many Christians have done for centuries. 
you choose a brief sentence or a simple phrase that can be repeated to Jesus in one breath. With practice, you can develop the habit of praying silent breath prayers. Jesus taught specifically against this spiritual practice or discipline of repeating words or phrases central to contemplative prayer. He said, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. The commands to pray without ceasing and to pray always are not literal as the mystics affirm because Jesus himself ceased from prayer. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, rather, these commands teach us to continually petition God as the persistent widow, a parable Jesus taught so that men ought always to pray and not to faint, not literally every moment of every day, but to never give up on asking God. Secondly, when asked how to pray, Jesus answered, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. When you pray, say. Therefore, sitting in silence or making breath prayers would be a direct contradiction of how Jesus taught us to pray. Yeah, I fear because of Rick Warren's efforts to promote contemplative prayer and mystical practice that Carl Ranner's prediction, prophetic uh, uh, view of the future is coming true, that the Christian of the future will be a mystic or they will not be a Christian at all. Because of these contemplative practices endorsed by Warren, many have connected him to the emergent church. I believe that Rick Warren was touting and promoting the emerging church even before it had that name. Since Rick Warren's popularity has exploded uh, and he did have an early uh, alignment with the emergent movement, that's created actually some problems for him and he's tried to back off from it. Rick Warren has criticized the emerging church and its preoccupation with postmodernism. Yet, Warren's ministry toolbox on his website, pastors.com, has featured several articles favorably presenting the emergent church movement and its leaders, such as Brian McLaren, Doug Paget, Tony Jones, and Dan Kimball. In Rick Warren's July 6, 2005 e-newsletter, he featured an article he wrote entitled, Sharing Eternal Truth with an Ever-Emerging Culture. One of the recommended links in this issue was to emergent leader Spencer Burke's organization, The Ooze. Spencer Burke's The Ooze is described as a community that learns from faith traditions outside the Christian fold, with a Buddhist family in their church, with whom they visited a Buddhist temple and participated in guided meditation with this family. There's power in listening to the heretic. And today, I actually think that uh, we need to listen to a few heretics in our world. When you go to uh, pastors.com, his, his website, uh, there's uh, an endorsement of uh, uh, emergent books, there's an endorsement of emergent practices. Uh, in fact, Dan Kimball's book called The Emergent Church. He actually endorsed Dan Kimball's book on The Emerging Church. In fact, he wrote the sidebars alternating with Brian McLaren for that book. In fact, I'll quote to you what he says about that book, which I think it makes it quite clear where he stands with much of the emerging church right here. Warren states, quote, This book is a wonderful, detailed example of what a purpose-driven church can look like in a postmodern world. My friend Dan Kimball writes passionately, while my book, The Purpose-Driven Church, explained uh, what the church is called to do, Dan's book explains how to do it with the cultural creatives who think and feel in postmodern terms. You need to pay attention to him because times are a-changing, end quote. I almost have to laugh when people say, Rick Warren's passé by the emerging church, that's what's happening now. When they don't even realize that he's one of the main taproots of emerging church without him actually having the label. Considering how much these movements have in common, it is no surprise that emergent church leader Brian McLaren attributes his becoming a pastor to Rick Warren. He writes, I literally would not be doing what I am doing if not for Rick's impact on my life. Why would a supposedly conservative evangelical pastor like Rick Warren want to lend his credibility to the emergent church 
and have his name be directly associated with its leaders. The answer may be found in Warren's mentor, Peter Drucker, and Leadership Network, the organization that initiated the emergent church. I've had nine different mentors in my life. Some of them were famous, some of them were not famous at all. But one of them was Peter Drucker, the founder of Modern American Management. He wrote dozens and dozens of books, and uh, I, was, I knew him up to his death in his mid-90s. And uh, uh, for 20 years he was a mentor, and I would drive up to his house, and I would go in, and as a young pastor, I'd want to tell him all the things that I was doing. Today I'm standing outside of the House of Industry where I'm going to go in and be the keynote speaker for the 100th centennial of Peter Drucker. On November 19th, 2009, leaders from the business and public sector, scholars, teachers, economists, and representatives of the nonprofit sector from all over the world gathered in Vienna, Austria to commemorate the 100th birthday of Peter F. Drucker. Peter was far more than the founder of modern management. He was far more than a brilliant man, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. He was a great soul. For nearly 25 years, Peter was a mentor to me and had a profound influence on my life in the particular area of leadership and personal development. Peter Drucker was born in 1909 in Austria and immigrated to America in 1937. He was a writer, management consultant, and self-described social ecologist. Drucker had taught at California's Claremont Graduate School for more than 30 years, where the Management Center carries on his name. He published over 30 books in addition to articles for the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, and Forbes. His books and popular scholarly articles explored how people are organized across the business, government, and the nonprofit sectors of society. Before his death in 2005, he had a worldwide reputation as the father of modern management. In the 1950s, he invents the modern corporation. Drucker's vision was that uh, somebody who was part of a corporation, uh, the, the, the corporation that he structured, would, that they would feel part of something bigger than themselves. They would be part of a community and that they would be able to experience success along with the successes of the company and they they knew their part in helping to bring about what you know the the vision that the CEO had for the corporation and and since you know since the 1950s until now uh, the majority of corporations now work off of the Druckerite model Drucker was committed to the existential philosophy of Danish writer Soren Kierkegaard Kierkegaard had his influence from Kant and uh, the idea that we live and there's an upper and lower story uh, that you have the lower story which has to do with those things that can be proved scientifically even though this is now disputed of course uh, that there is uh, the the ability of science to come up with absolutes this seemed to be the answer that there are no absolutes and this is what you get from Kierkegaard Peter Drucker um is a Soren Kierkegaardian existentialist. He spends his adult life really trying to solve that existential alienation problem that is caused by the displacement of modern technologies. Concerning religious philosophies, Peter Drucker was influenced by Zen, Japanese artwork, and Confucianism. Earlier in his life, he drew upon the wisdom of the philosopher Martin Buber. Among Buber's published works are I and Thou, which teaches a form of existentialism, and ecstatic confessions, the heart of mysticism. Expressing his own religious philosophy and the pantheistic influence of Buber, Drucker writes, Society needs a return to spiritual values, not to offset the material, but to make it fully productive. Mankind needs to return to spiritual values, for it needs compassion. It needs the deep experience that the thou and the I are one which all higher religions share. This presentation would not permit the time to unpack the philosophies of Zen, Confucianism, German mysticism, and existentialism. Drucker's own confession should suffice to demonstrate that he was not a Christian. I'm not the born-again Christian, no. I've been going to church and I've, and I've been tithing all my life, but I do not claim to be 
And the best thing I, I wrote was an essay on a great religious thinker. I said, if you read one thing of mine, read my essay on Kierkegaard. It's the best, what? I have. It's the best thing I ever wrote, easily. Drucker's view of the nature of man is not derived from the Bible, but rather from the ever-changing social sciences. He created a new postmodern, non-economic man, which is incomplete without community. Drucker's first book, The End of Economic Man, was written in 1939 after fleeing from fascist totalitarianism of the Nazi regime. Drucker wrote, the Western democracies have to realize that totalitarian fascism cannot be overcome by socialism, by capitalist democracy, or by a combination of both. It can only be overcome by a new, non-economic concept of a free and equal society. This new society became Drucker's project for the rest of his life. In the first half of the 20th century, Drucker saw the corporation as the organism that could meet man's felt need for community but the corporation failed to fulfill Drucker's vision. Beginning in the mid-60s, Drucker discovered that the megachurch would be the entity to provide humanity with a an healthy and socialized community. But this discovery had nothing to do with Christianity. In fact, Drucker criticized Christianity as being too individualistic. In spite of his need and search, Christianity and the churches have been unable to provide a religious social solution. All they can do today is to give the individual religion. They cannot give a new society and a new community. Personal religious experience may be invaluable to the individual. It may restore his peace, may give him a personal God and rational understanding of his own function and nature, but it cannot recreate society and cannot make social community life sensible. Therefore, Drucker was intrigued by megachurches, not because of their spiritual beliefs, but because they pragmatically met felt needs of humanity. Drucker decided that the megachurch seemed to be the best approach to appeal to the American culture. The megachurch had greater influence on the culture in the United States than did academia, the university system, educational system, the uh, corporate world of America. In fact, they were the ones that got things done. Uh, how did you get interested in the megachurch? Because I looked out the window. There was that phenomenon, period. And I'm curious. But not from a religious... Huh? I mean, you were not interested from a personal religious point of view? Or? Uh, no. Uh, my interest in the megachurches was as a social phenomenon, as the uh, that but we talked about it yesterday. My old and abiding interest in community, I saw them creating community. To Drucker, his interest in the megachurch was purely from a sociological and economical standpoint. Denominations and sound doctrine was not a consideration for Drucker. There's a Forbes article that was written maybe about 2001, 2002, where they were asking why he switched gears from um, the business world to the religious world. He said, if theologians were, were left in charge of, uh, of, you know, uh, of animal biology, they would tell us that there's only one right finch in the world. Well, there's 243 different you know, species of varieties of finch, and they're all right. And then theologians will have us arguing about theology and doctrine and stuff like that. That doesn't matter. All of them are right. It was specifically Drucker's quest for optimum community which led him to the megachurch as the most effective agent of change in American life. Early years were spent on politics. The middle portion of his career was spent in the corporate world. The last part of his career was spent in religion and Christianity as a whole. He took three disciples. Um, Rick Warren, Bill Hybels, and Bob Buford of Leadership Network. Christianity Today reported, Over the last 20 years, Drucker has had a good deal of interaction with what he calls pastoral churches. These include megachurches like Bill Hybels' Willow Creek or Rick Warren's Saddleback Community. Bob Buford's Leadership Network has invited Drucker to speak to conferences of large church leaders 
and has linked him to many pastors seeking advice. Because of Drucker's influence, many are reluctant to dismiss the incredible success of these organizations as mere coincidence. That those two would become the two, probably the two most influential two pastors in the entire country, let alone the Western world. Um, now, was that just coincidence? The Peter Drucker-Rick Warren relationship may surprise many, but it dates back over two decades to when the young Rick Warren came to Drucker for advice. Under Drucker's tutelage, Warren's own success has been considerable as his Saddleback Church has grown to be one of the largest churches in America, and his book, The Purpose Driven Life, is this decade's bestseller. He took the concepts from Drucker and created a system where he could reproduce his saddleback to current churches. And so he exported this whole thing. Rick Warren stated, I did a series of lectures for the faculty in the Kennedy School and also in the law school. I spoke to several groups of faculty and several groups of students, and I started with this quote from Peter Drucker. The most significant sociological phenomenon of the first half of the 20th century was the rise of the corporation. The most significant sociological phenomenon of the second half of the 20th century has been the development of the large pastoral church, of the megachurch. It is the only organization that is actually working in our society. Now Drucker has said that at least six times. I happen to know because he's my mentor. I've spent 20 years under his tutelage learning about leadership from him, and he's written it in two or three books, and he says he thinks it's the only thing that really works in society. What do you say to a group of Druckerites about Peter Drucker? I mean, I could easily stand here and rattle off a hundred Drucker principles and proverbs that you all know. Uh, and we all know them because they're all so memorable. But I don't want to talk to you, uh, as we just close tonight, in just a word, not about his principle, about, but about Peter the man. I loved Peter Drucker. I didn't just admire him. I love this man. In my life, I've had a number of different mentors in different areas of my life. And Peter was one of those mentors Stephen Lee, pastor of the Purpose Driven Hong Kong campus, first met Rick Warren in 2006, quote, because he has heard so much about him during his time working as the CEO of Peter Drucker Academy, the first private company registered in China as a charity organization, unquote. It is this shared love for Drucker that brought the two together. Saddleback Church reported in Bringing Saddleback to Hong Kong, Saddleback Hong Kong is a strategic church because of the connections it has with China. Stephen's years at Peter Drucker taught him many of the same principles and values that Saddleback Church has. Stephen inserts, Ordinary people make a difference. Ordinary people do extraordinary things. It comes from Peter Drucker. I am able to agree to this in such short time with only a month of training because I know Peter Drucker in depth. Saddleback Church and Rick Warren stand for the same. Notice that Stephen Lee acknowledges that Saddleback Church and Rick Warren stand for the same thing as Peter Drucker. Lee can say this with such confidence because he knows Peter Drucker in depth. He said it is by Peter Drucker that ordinary people do extraordinary things. The source is admittedly Drucker not Jesus Christ. Peter Drucker was uh, a, a truly Renaissance man. He, he studied widely, he read widely, and he understood society as a whole probably better than anybody uh, of, of his generation. Uh, certainly was brilliant, but he, he is often known simply in the area of management and economics, but really he had much more to offer than that. He was a keen observer of society, and the impact of demography on society, the impact of social trends on society, the impact of spirituality and religion. And his 
uh, general consensus uh, attitude was it all matters. Within the pages of The Essential Drucker by Peter Drucker, we read about how Bill Hybels also utilized Drucker's business practices to design a church that catered to the customer's needs. It says, Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois, outside Chicago, has become the nation's largest church. Bill Hybels designed a church to answer the potential customer's needs. G.A. Pritchard wrote, Willow Creek strategy has also been discussed in the pages of Fortune magazine and the Wall Street Journal. In the latter, Peter Drucker explains that Willow Creek and its imitators are employing simple marketing ideas. None of these marketing lessons are new. Anyone who has taken a marketing course these past 30 years or who has read a marketing text should know them. In Bill Hybels' book, Courageous Leadership, he cites his conversations with Drucker in regard to leadership. In his own words, under a subsection entitled Consulting Mentors about Performance Evaluations, Hybels referred to Peter Drucker as one of the two men who have most shaped my thinking on this issue next to Jesus. Hybels crystallized his vision for Willow Creek in the 1980s at a dinner conversation with Drucker. Before Leadership Network, a.k.a. the Emerging Church, began, its founder, Bob Buford, was also consulting with Drucker. Bob Buford is not only the founder of Leadership Network, but also the founder of the Peter F. Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management. Bob Buford has often expressed his deep admiration for Drucker. Buford based Leadership Network on business management principles that he learned from Drucker. Following Drucker's strategies, Bob Buford only recruited leaders from successful churches as the first customers, worked only with those who were receptive to his goals, and only worked on things that would make a great deal of impact if successful. In 20 years of consultation with Leadership Network as a featured speaker and resource, Drucker's genius for business management caused the number of megachurches, over 2,000 attending, to grow tenfold. Drucker's influence was so remarkable on Leadership Network that Buford says the organization belongs partly to him. Yeah, I think I had the opportunity to have the world's best mentor. The person, Peter Drucker was the person that I most respected who was alive in my time. My first introduction to Peter Drucker came through Leadership Network and I was invited to meet Peter Drucker and Bob Buford and spend three days with, uh, with them. Peter Drucker was the speaker, Bob Buford was the one who funded the program. And while there I met a number of the professors from uh, Fuller Seminary as well as uh, some young men who had been invited through Leadership Network uh, and Bob Buford uh, to come. There were a couple of our uh, assistant pastors uh, from the Calvary Chapel that were there as well. Weren't sure what it was all about. Uh, heard a lot about Peter Drucker and his systems management I did not become involved with Leadership Network. Uh, I just met for that short period of time. Apologist and pirate Christian radio host Chris Rosebro interviewed emergent leader Doug Paget regarding the beginnings of the emergent church. Can you tell us about what Leadership Network is and who Bob Buford is and, and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff to start off with? 
Yeah, Bob Buford uh, is the uh, funder and originator of a network called Leadership Network. So I was hired to create what they referred to in internal language there as the Young Leaders Network. Got it. And it was young in relationship to the other networks that exist in Leadership Network. I don't think a lot of people really get this, is that you practically handpicked the entire crop of current uh, – leaders both in the seeker driven purpose driven and emergent movements all by yourself you got tony jones dan kimball mark driscoll you've got rob bell uh craig groeschel uh you know andy stanley all of the chris, the, yeah, yeah, chris right. c uh yeah and a bunch of women leadership network was really instrumental in helping to start uh, willow creek as well as uh, saddleback is, is am i correct in that well not not the churches but they were influential in helping them think about creating um, associations where churches could learn from their particular models. Okay, so like the Willow Creek Association. Willow Creek Association, the, pur the Purpose Driven Association. Okay, and um, and Buford, uh, he he's uh, he was really tight with uh, Peter Drucker, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Bob and Peter were personal friends, and uh -huh. Peter Drucker, who's um, a management guru to some people's mind, and a thinker on on uh, especially nonprofit. Uh, management principles mm -hmm. had encouraged Bob um, to think about investing his wealth in supporting churches, believing that one of the most under realized and under examined and under resourced movements in North America in the 20th century was the advent of the large mega church, mm -hmm. typically in suburbs and sort of non denominational large mega churches. He goes on to state that the Druckerites, Bob Buford, Bill Hybels, and Rick Warren, formed, bankrolled, and promoted the emerging church much the same way a music marketing company might form and promote a boy band like the Backstreet Boys or NSYNC. Rick Warren also endorsed Leadership Network organizer Bob Buford's book, Halftime, calling Buford a rare individual, and said, I want every man in my congregation to read this inspiring story. Bob Buford reciprocates admiration to Rick Warren, saying on his official website, Expect to meet changemakers. In the early days of Leadership Network, it was Bill Hybels and Rick Warren. Now these two have enormous self-sufficient teaching ministries on their own. As for megachurch pastor Bill Hybels and Willow Creek's role with Leadership Network in the emerging church, Bob Buford says, The first Foundation Conference was held in Dallas, and was the beginning of a partnership between Bob and Linda, Leadership Network and Willow Creek Community Church. Bob and Linda provided the vision and willingness to underwrite any shortfall. Bill Hybels and the music and drama team from Willow Creek provided expertise in designing messages that hit the heart through a very high-quality blend of the spoken work, music, and drama. Considering the loyalties of Rick Warren and Bill Hybels toward Peter Drucker, it is no wonder that they have endorsed and promoted the Emerging Church, a product developed by fellow Druckerite Bob Buford. Bill Hybels um, and Willow Creek played a, a very key role in launching um, Rob Bell and his church, Mars Hill, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. When you travel to uh, Willow Creek, when you go into their bookstore, they have an entire section of the bookstore dedicated to just about every single sermon delivered by Rob Bell at Willow Creek. You can purchase them. Every single Numa DVD video is available. Every single book, and it's featured prominently. The reason why you will not, you will not hear Rick Warren or Bill Hybels publicly say Rob Bell Tony Jones, Doug Paget, and them are teaching false doctrine is because they have a vested interest in the success of their products because they help develop them. Leadership Network also was a very powerful force in all this. When I would call on somebody or go visit a church or, you know, go to an event and I would say I'm with Leadership Network, um, people tended to know what that meant. Uh huh. Um, so it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't the Doug Paget ness. So much as it was, uh, um, you know, the the power of the position. You uh, you had the clout of uh, Bob Buford and and Peter Drucker and uh, the Willow Creek Association and the Saddleback Association all behind you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was like, hey, the, 
those are people I know who that group is. They write some good stuff, and they're you know they do some good things. Implementing the secular business practices into the church from Peter Drucker, who was not even a Christian, will inevitably lead to destruction because it is making Drucker's humanistic model the foundation for building and growing the church. Whereas the Bible teaches us that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, men can follow God's way or man's way in pursuit of church growth. May church leaders hearing this message be encouraged to follow God's way, since it is God's church, and Jesus said, I will build my church. Certainly Peter Drucker meant well in his quest for optimum community, but his worldly business management philosophies in the megachurch and emerging church movements have acted like steroids being injected into the body of Christ, causing unnatural, monster growth from which the consequences will be severe and fatal. You can't talk community development without talking about churches and mosques and temples and synagogues. You just can't talk about it because they are the community. So my challenge uh, to you is, can we not all get along? What are the global giants in the world? What are the problems that affect billions of people, not millions? The vehicle to bring about Drucker's vision of a new society is Rick Warren's peace plan. Warren unveiled his purpose-driven peace plan in Angel Stadium before 30,000 church members on April 17, 2005. When he announced it, first they kicked off with Purple Haze, Rick Warren singing, you know, Purple Haze in my brain, you know, Jimi Hendrix's song about LSD. Jimi Hendrix talks about how he was possessed and songs just came out of him, you know. And here we're singing a song, not, not me, but, you know, these guys are singing this song, Rick Warren leading with his band backing him uh, about Purple Haze and, you know, back to the 60s and that whole mentality of the age of Aquarius. And here he announces his peace plan. When I studied and read uh, Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan that he launched at the stadium in California, with the song of Jimi Hendrix song. There was nothing in that song about the gospel. Why would you want to launch a global peace plan with a pagan or an atheist, or, or, or where there's the lyrics of which have nothing to do with the gospel? In introducing his peace plan, Warren said, my hope is for a new reformation in the church and a new spiritual awakening throughout the world. Warren also believes that the popularity of his book, The Purpose Driven Life, is an indication of this new reformation in Christianity. He stated, I believe that we are possibly on the verge of a new reformation in Christianity and another great awakening in our nation. The signs are everywhere, including the popularity of this book. But what is this new reformation, this new spiritual awakening associated with Saddleback's peace plan and Drucker's new society? In 1982, Robert Schuller issued a call for a new reformation in his book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. Then in 1999, C. Peter Wagner announced a new apostolic reformation in his book, Churchquake. But I want to remind you that the new apostolic reformation is the most radical change in the way of doing church since the Protestant Reformation. That's what we're, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're springing off into the 21st century with. Now Rick Warren is calling for yet another new reformation based on his peace plan to wipe out the global problems and make the church relevant to unbelievers. Rick Warren later changed the P in his peace acrostic from planting churches to promote reconciliation. For example, listen to his speech before an audience of Muslims who would have found the idea of planting Christian churches offensive. On page 48 of Brian McLaren's book, Everything Must Change, he speaks in favor of Warren's peace plan. McLaren says, Under the banner of a five-point peace plan, Warren called local churches to participate in a second reformation. This first reformation, led by Martin Luther, Warren explains, was about belief. 
This one will be about deeds. It is about what the church should be doing in the world. Many of you know Rick Warren, the well-known pastor from Southern California. Uh, and, and I was so impressed. You know, Rick wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life that sold. It broke all kinds of sales records. I don't know how many gazillion it sold, but it, it really has been incredible. It was an incredibly significant publication. Now, what would really be interesting when someone writes a book called The Purpose Driven Life and they, they suddenly get huge amounts of money and fame and influence coming their way, then it'll be interesting to watch how does the author use all that fame, money, and influence, you know? What, you'll really see what his purpose is at that point. Not just what he writes about, but how he lives. And you know what Rick did with all of that fame and power and influence that came his way? He said, we've got to get people concerned about global crises. He came up with a list of five. If you know Rick, you know it would be in an acrostic, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Uh, per Warren discussed his peace plan as follows. When Jesus sent the disciples into a village, he said, find the man of peace. And he said, when you find the man of peace, you start working with that person. And if they respond to you, you work with them. If they don't, you dust off your shoes, you go to the next village. Who's the man of peace in any village? Or it might be a woman of peace who has the most respect. They're open and they're influential. They don't have to be a Christian. In fact, they could be a Muslim. But they're open and they're influential and you work with them to attack the five giants. And that's going to bring the second reformation. Do you want to work with us on poverty, disease, AIDS, illiteracy, injustice? I often find people are more unwilling to work with us than we are willing to work with them. In other words, we're saying you don't have to change your beliefs for us to work with you. If you can only work with people that you agree with, then most of the world, you're ruling out. Right. Okay? I don't insist that a Muslim change his belief for me to work on poverty. I don't even insist that a, a, a gay person has to change their beliefs. They're not going to accept my belief, or I'm not going to accept theirs, but I just met with the... When I'm out working on trying to stop AIDS, I'll work with an atheist, I'll work with a gay person, I'll work with somebody who totally disagrees with me. If they want to work on an issue, fine. Why? We're building a bridge. Warren's peace plan includes unbelievers, Muslims, homosexuals, etc., setting aside differences and working together to fight poverty, disease, AIDS, illiteracy, and injustice. This, according to Warren, will bring about the Second Reformation. Thus, Warren's Reformation is a social reformation rather than a spiritual one. And so the Reformation needs to be about what we, what we do, not what we say we do. In conjunction with his peace plan, Rick Warren is promoting the three-legged stool, a concept introduced by Peter Drucker as a means to bring together different sectors in society. Drucker believed that the only way to persuade the world to accept change was to engage the public sector of effective government, the private sector of effective business, and the social sector of effective community organizations, including nonprofit faith based organizations. Over the last two years, I've spent a lot of time flying around meeting with every country we go into. We meet with the government leaders, we meet with the business leaders, and we meet, we meet with the pastors. We train the pastors, but we also meet with these other legs of the stool so that they understand they have to bring the church to the table. Uh, there's a role for uh, the public sector, there's a role for the private sector, and there's a role for the faith sector. Each of them can do something that, that none of the other three can do. Can we not work together uh, in building the three legs of the stool? For the last three years, I've been working on a prototype of this. It's called the Peace Plan, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Promote reconciliation, equip ethical leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. Peter Drucker, when he got involved with the mega churches, he came to recognize that one of the easiest things to put together, of course, as we understand, is the, a world economic system. And we're about there now. That's the easiest part of the stool to get together in a one world order. The second part is the governance of, of that. That's more difficult. And it takes the crises to develop that. 
and then you take advantage of the crises that is created. But the most difficult is how in the world do you get the heart of these people? My feeling, of course, is that third leg of the stool is the last leg to be developed, and that will be a religious leg, a religion that is man-made and not God-made. If you are a global business leader, you need to understand that the future of the world is not secularism. It is religious pluralism. You may not like that, but you're going to have to deal with it. Warren's Reformation has little to do with preaching the gospel, but much to do with all religions setting aside their differences in order to solve global problems. The person over here who asked about uh, the millennial goals, I uh, met last month with uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, to talk about faith-based organizations working with the UN on this. And later you should talk to Tony Blair, who's just formed a foundation. He's much too humble to talk about it on this very issue. To my brother, Islamic brother here from Italy, I would say, I'm not really interested in interfaith dialogue. I'm interested in interfaith projects. We got enough talk. <laughs> Notice how Warren's peace plan is distinctly different than Jesus' peace plan. In Warren's project, Christians and Muslims are equally yoked together in ministry, whereas Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus' peace plan brings a sword of division between Christians and those hostile to the gospel, such as Muslims, so that a man's foes shall be those of his own household. This sword that Jesus spoke of was his word, and the gospel that would divide households once allegiances were made to his kingdom. While Warren's plan is seeking to bring about interfaith peace and world peace, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Jesus came to bring peace with God through repentance and faith in Him, not world peace, as Warren's peace plan achieves. Just as Drucker criticized Christianity for being too individualistic, the church growth movement seeks to appeal to unbelieving people groups collectively. Paul Smith writes, The Fuller School of World Missions founding dean, Donald McGavran, introduced a new theory. He advocated that missionaries should not make a gospel appeal for a response from an individual, but elicit responses from groups of people. This new missional theory appealed to unbelieving homogenous people groups to collectively agree to abandon their old religion, identify with Christ, claim the Bible as their authority, claim the church as their religious institution. An entire people group or society being Christianized cannot be equated with individuals one by one being born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth, it's an individual matter. It's individually coming to Jesus. But in fulfillment of Drucker's lifelong goal of creating a new society through the megachurch, Time magazine reported, Over the last four years, Warren has beta-tested his plan by sending almost 8,000 members of his own 22,000 member Saddleback Church congregation and an undetermined number from 12 other congregations to work in 68 nations. The flagship project has been in Rwanda, whose president has declared his intentions to make his country the world's first purpose-driven nation. Simply called the Peace Plan, this ambitious effort takes Warren's purpose-driven philosophies to new heights. Rwanda became the first nation to sign up, thanks in large part to the country's president, Paul Kagame, and his unique relationship with Pastor Warren. This next step involves bringing the country's three sectors of society together to work on developing the country. The, the component of faith and Christianity, government and business. Success here means this peace model may one day be replicated in other countries. A possible goal is 68 other countries and Saddleback Church has sent out nearly 8,000 members in small teams around the world. I want to tell you, I'm more excited about 
uh, purpose-driven and the peace plan than I've ever been because I saw an amazing result. In what, I'm watching an entire nation being transformed because of you, Saddleback Church. The president was flat out overjoyed. I spent two days with the president's advisory council, which I serve on. I spoke to a national prayer breakfast to about 400 of the leading government leaders. There was great enthusiasm. In fact, they've asked me to train their leadership. I had private meetings with the, uh, the president of the central bank, the governor of the central bank, and the prime minister, of course, with the president. Uh, and these men have asked me to do leadership training uh, for that nation with the government because they've seen what's happened with our pastors. This idea of a purpose-driven nation or purpose-driven country or purpose-driven society is no different than Emperor Constantine's intentions with the Holy Roman Empire. In the early 4th century AD, Constantine adopted the Christian faith for the entire Roman Empire. Constantine declared that the Roman world is now Christian. Christianizing a nation, an entire society, proved to be a fatal mistake. After Constantine's declaration, Christianity was mixed with the empire's existing secular beliefs and holidays, causing confusion which remains today. As Rick Warren launched the Purpose Driven Living in Uganda campaign, the following press release also spoke of the Purpose Driven Country and the Purpose Driven Continent. Pastor Rick has partnered with the President and others to make Rwanda a Purpose Driven Country. I ask why not Uganda as well? Archbishop Arombi challenged an unprecedented gathering of 450 national leaders at a banquet gathered to hear Dr. Warren speak. Uganda should be a purpose-driven nation as well. But it takes people of purpose to build purpose-driven churches, purpose-driven communities, and a purpose-driven country. Someday, we will have a purpose-driven continent. You know, we told uh, the Rwandans about our next goal, now that we've gone to every nation, we're now going to go to the 3,800 unengaged people groups, these small tribes that don't have a, uh, any church in it between now and the end of the decade. While Warren's plan for changing and reaching the world are very noble, it is dreadful to think that the watered-down, easy-believism version of the gospel is not only being spread all over the world, but now going to be proclaimed to unreached people groups of the world. Hi, I'm Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California and author of The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life. I'm going to talk to you about something that's deeply embedded in my heart and maybe it's embedded in yours. If you care about taking the whole gospel to the whole world in a whole new way, I want to talk to you for just a minute. In an article entitled, Rick Warren in Rwanda announces plans to host all 54 African nations at Purpose Driven Church Congress, the Christian Post reports, Pastor Rick Warren announces plans for the All Africa Purpose Driven Church Congress to be held in August 6 through 10, 2015. The report continues. The conference will be the first of five annual continent-wide conferences to take place by 2020, with the second plan to be held in Latin America in 2016. This conference will be held in Rwanda, the first purpose-driven nation. Warren explained how the idea for the peace plan was birthed in 2003, but it became a reality as Rwanda became the first purpose-driven nation. Warren said, most nations are validated by their strength in exports. Rwanda can become famous for exporting leadership. Rwanda should be the leadership and innovation capital of the continent of Africa. That is why I am calling leaders from across the continent to come to Rwanda next year to learn. The strength of Rwanda is not in the ground, it's in the people. Rick Warren is pointing to Rwanda as the model for the entire continent of Africa. In other words, the country, which became the first purpose-driven nation, is now Warren's model for what he hopes will be the first purpose-driven continent. Pastor Rick Warren cast the following vision for the year 2015. Now let me tell you about a couple of opportunities we've got coming up in our church in 2015 since this is Vision Weekend. Paul says there's a wide open door for a great work here. We have just been given a wide open door like no other church in the history of Christianity. 
an opportunity to impact an entire continent. Let me give you the background. We started the peace plan about 10 years ago to promote reconciliation and plant churches, to equip leaders, to assist the poor, to care for the sick, to educate the next generation. Over the next 10 years, we sent out 23,869 of our members to 197 nations. Nobody has ever done that, ever, anywhere, in 2,000 years of Christianity. This is the most global-minded church on the planet, bar none, bar none. One of those 197 countries was a little nation called Rwanda, only 10 million people had been devastated by a genocide 20 years ago when a million people were killed. The president of that country, Pastor, uh, President Paul Kagame, read my book, Purpose Driven Life. And he wrote me a letter and he says, I read Purpose Driven Life, I'm a man of purpose. I invite you to come and help us rebuild our nation, help us become the first purpose driven nation. Bring the peace plan, bring, bring your training. And so while we were sending 23,000 members to every nation, we made a concerted effort to send 1,200 of our members to this little country called Rwanda. And we began to train them in everything possible to help them rebuild. We first started with the churches, working in and through the churches. Over 4,000 churches, 3,000, 4,000 churches have gone through purpose-driven training. Over 2,000 of them have completed three years of training. These churches are growing, they're caring for the sick, they're assisting the poor, they're helping educate the next generation. They're doing things that the government had neither the money nor the expertise to do. Now, when this started happening in Rwanda, I started getting calls first from other business leaders, other church leaders, other African leaders, and then I started getting calls from the presidents of nations. I've had five African presidents call me and say, when are you bringing the peace plan to our nation? And I said, well, we're not, but we'll send the Rwandans because we'll train them to train others, to train others, to train others. So then I got the idea, well, what about instead of us going to them, why don't we bring them all in to Rwanda? So a month ago, I invited the top leaders of 35 nations, 31 African nations, and leaders from Russia, from China, from India, and from the United States. 35 nations invited them to go with me to Rwanda to see this national miracle of a purpose-driven nation and the purpose and the peace plan. And we, we took them, I, I let them see how we work with business leaders, and I took them a lot of them to see how we work with government leaders, and I took them and let them see how we work with educational leaders, and of course I let them see, most of all, how we're working through the churches, the church is the center of the community. And every one of these leaders said, we're going back to our nation to plan a steering committee for a purpose-driven peace plan strategy national, nationwide in our nation. So next year, in August, we're gonna hold the first All Africa Continental Congress for purpose-driven leadership in Rwanda. They've just got a new convention center finished. And we're gonna bring the top leaders from all 54 African nations together. And we're gonna train them in how to do PD, purpose-driven, and the peace plan. Notice this is not about bringing the gospel or Jesus to other nations, but bringing the peace plan to other nations. Working with business leaders, government leaders, and educational leaders has nothing to do with the Great Commission. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Warren mentions assisting the poor, caring for the sick, and educating the next generation, which are all meaningful ministries. But he omits the preaching of the gospel, making disciples, and teaching them to observe all things Jesus commanded. Warren's peace plan is not a fulfillment of the Great Commission. So in 2015, I'm going to host an All Africa Purpose Driven Church Leadership Training Conference in the heart of the continent of Africa in Kigali, Rwanda. Unlike Saddleback Church, 
The church described in the Bible never yoked itself with government and business in order to change the globe through humanitarian efforts. The kingdom of Christ and his church is not an earthly political kingdom of this world. It is separate from the world and the affairs of the state. With worldly nations like Rwanda and Uganda becoming purpose-driven nations through the peace plan, the Apostle John tells us, They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. James 4.4 4 declares, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Yet Warren's peace plan and new society envisioned by his mentor Peter Drucker is increasingly embraced by politicians, celebrities, and world leaders. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, which the Council on Foreign Relations is seeking to build a new world order. And at first he just blatantly denied that he was a member of the CFR. And then later it came out that, yeah, he was a member and admitted that he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So his peace plan is, is, is very, very uh, scary as it fits into the, this whole ecumenical movement, this whole God's dream, kingdom, dominion, new world order, and where the church is headed at this time. Even President Obama sparked controversy when he asked Rick Warren to lead the prayer at the presidential inauguration in January of 2009. After Warren began his speech, he said these words. The scripture tells us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you are the compassionate and merciful one. And you are loving to everyone you have made. Warren appeals to the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The first half of the paragraph, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, is the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.5, the most notable prayer in Judaism. But a problem arises when Warren says, You are the compassionate and merciful one. Yes, God is compassionate, and yes, God is merciful. But you won't find these attributes grouped together like this anywhere in the Bible. You will find them, however, consistently scattered throughout the Quran. In fact, 113 chapters, all except one, begin with, In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Other translations translate this phrase as entirely merciful, the especially merciful, or most gracious, most compassionate. Regardless of how this Arabic expression is translated, merciful and compassionate are consistently grouped together throughout the Quran and attributed to Allah, but never do they appear in this way in regard to Yahweh in the Bible. Then you have Rick Warren at Barack Obama's you know, inaugural prayer, doing the inaugural prayer, and he's praying in the name of Isa at one point. I humbly ask this in the name of the one who changed my life, Yeshua, Isa, Jesus, Jesus. Isa is, is not the Jesus of the Bible, Isa is the Jesus of the Quran, which is a different Jesus, again, who didn't die for our sins and who is not God in the flesh, is not the Son of God. Uh, and then you have him also addressing the ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. Which just a couple years prior to that was designated by the Justice Department as, as a terrorist group or funding terrorism. And he doesn't give them the gospel. So we say, well, yeah, he came to preach Jesus to them, you know, and hey, you know, praise God. I'd, I'm all for standing up at the gates of hell and proclaiming the gospel. That would be awesome. But that's not what happened. He encourages them on how to be successful. Uh, now, <laughs> when you look at what Islam teaches about ultimate success in the Quran is the domination over every other religion of Islam by Islam through the use of jihad and if you're you know going out you're against your enemy and slaying him wherever you find him and and Christians are allowed to live as long as they submit to Islam and, and pay pay the toll tax you know uh, otherwise they're persecuted they're beheaded uh, so it's getting really sad as to where this is all headed because these are the leaders of the visible professing church working with Muslims to bring this new world order about I was asked to speak to you about how can Muslims and Christians 
nations to work closer together for the greater good in our world. And I will tell you that I'm not interested in interfaith dialogue. I am interested in interfaith projects. There's a big difference. Warren gave practical examples of how Muslims and Christians could work together on his peace plan. Christians are to boldly proclaim the gospel to Muslims, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in Jesus' name, rather than trying to find a common word with them or common ground in order to work for the common good. The gospel of Jesus Christ was absent from Warren's entire speech. Now, dear friends, as globalization draws us closer and closer together, one of the most pressing questions we have to ask ourselves is how do we deal with our deepest differences? It is a fundamental question we have to wrestle with. How do we live together in peace and harmony? And not only that, how can we actually work together, maintaining our separate traditions, maintaining our convictions without compromise, but working together for the greater good of everybody in the world. In this statement, is not Warren essentially stating that the convictions of Muslims are fine and worth maintaining without compromise or being challenged? Jesus said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Who is a liar but he that denies the Son? Christ-rejecting Muslims are enemies of God, but Rick Warren believes they can contribute to the greater good of humanity? We must say, with a billion, over one billion Muslims and over two billion Christians, together as half the world, we have to do something about modeling what it means to live in peace, to live in harmony. We need to join together to create some kind of coalition to end stereotyping. We will never solve any of the major problems of the world until you involve houses of faith, mosques, temples, synagogues, churches, and so forth. There are 600,000 booths in the world. There are 800,000 Hindus in the world. There are over a billion Muslims, a couple billion Christians. Most of the world has some kind of faith. How can a Christian make such a statement? What Rick Warren is saying is that Christians need to join together with those who reject Christ in order to solve the world's problems. Jesus also said, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Recently, an article from the Orange County Register was published entitled, Rick Warren Builds Bridge to Muslims. It described how Warren is part of an effort named King's Way that is attempting to bring evangelical Christians and Muslims together. The Reverend Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in Lake Forest and one of America's most influential Christian leaders, has embarked on an effort to heal divisions between evangelical Christians and Muslims by partnering with Southern California mosques and proposing a set of theological principles that includes acknowledging that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. The news went viral on the web when many bloggers and critics of Warren responded. In anticipation of a second article from the Orange County Register, Saddleback offered a preemptive strike in Warren's defense in which Warren stated, A week ago a reporter published an article in the Orange County Register about Saddleback Church that contained many errors and false assumptions. It erroneously stated that we have a partnership with a local Muslim mosque. That is false. However, the second OCR article confirms that Saddleback did indeed partner with a local Muslim mosque. In a February 10th interview with the Register, Tom Holliday, associate senior pastor at Saddleback, described the outreach to Muslims as a multi-pronged effort that includes sharing meals at mosques during religious holidays and working together with Muslims on joint community service projects. Warren continued, it erroneously reported that our church had agreed to a theological document with Muslims. The document, titled King's Way, co-authored by Abraham Muhlenberg, a Saddleback pastor in charge of interfaith outreach, 
and Jihad Turk, director of religious affairs of the Islamic Center of Southern California, was presented at a December dinner at Saddleback attended by 300 Christians and Muslims. The Islamic Center of Southern California, the website for Turk's Mosque, published a blog post entitled ICSC co-authors historic interfaith document that demonstrates the new theological position of Saddleback. It featured a photo of Turk and Muhlenberg addressing the Saddleback audience beneath a projection on a screen with the heading King's Way. Saddleback has affirmed that the photograph was taken at Saddleback, more specifically the Saddleback Peace Center. The projected slide says King's Way. King's Way describes a path to end the 1400 years of misunderstanding between Muslims and Christians by consulting the texts we each call sacred to form a basis that allows us the privilege to serve the needs of our community together. Nevertheless, Warren went on in his defense, stating, It erroneously reported that we had agreed to not evangelize with Muslims. That is false. However, the second Orange County Register article notes, Tom Holliday, associate senior pastor at Saddleback, said the purpose of the effort was not to convert Muslims, but rather to work together to serve the community. Asked if the effort was done with Warren's knowledge and approval, Holliday replied, Of course it has his approval. The very definition of partnership is working together, and this is what Saddleback is doing with Muslims to serve the community. The Bible says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Jihad Turk, Kingsway co-author, had emphasized that Muslims agreed to participate in the Saddleback outreach effort because members of both faiths agreed our purpose is not to convert one another, but rather to work on ways to make the world a better place by breaking down walls of misunderstanding. The testimonies do not match up with that of Rick Warren's. Warren continues, It erroneously reported that we believe Saddleback and Muslims worship the same God. That is false. A person attending the King's Way meeting could easily have come to the conclusion that Muslims and Christians worship the same God based on the vague language of the document itself, saying, We believe in one God. God is one, and God is the Creator. With support for each of these claims from the Bible and the Quran, David Sean, Warren's chief of staff, told Jim Hinch in a register editor that the story was factually correct except in its statement that Warren believes Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Rather, Sean said that it would be more accurate to state that Christians and Muslims both believe in one God. Apparently, Sean asked the OCR to publish a correction to the article, but later withdrew the request. Warren has stated, Neither I nor my staff had ever seen such a document until the article mentioned it. It wasn't created or even seen by us. Saddleback Church as a church was not involved. Obviously, David Sean... Tom Holliday and Abraham Muhlenberg, all members of Saddleback staff, all knew about Kingsway prior to the article being published. The public statements and photographic evidence do not corroborate Warren's defense. Amy Spreeman of Stand Up for the Truth published an article entitled, Why is Saddleback Pastor Teaching on the Kingdom Circles?, which provides the context of why Jihad Turk is working with Saddleback. Saddleback Pastor Abraham Muhlenberg spoke at an event in France in June 2012. In the diagram behind him, the Kingdom Circles are part of the session. The Kingdom Circles are a simple but highly questionable evangelical tool that people are being taught to draw in order to demonstrate how those of other faiths can enter the Kingdom of God without converting to Christianity. The Kingdom of God. Or in Arabic, you could say, Malakut Allah. Now, if this circle represents Christians, and this circle represents Muslims, what's happened for so many years is that Christians have been telling Muslims, you've got to come over into our circle, become a Christian. That's the only way you can come into the kingdom of God. Or Muslims have been saying, hey, come over here, you've got to become a Muslim. That's how, that's how you really know God and, and are able to... Uh, move in the right direction. But really, 
those things aren't the issue. The real issue is how can we both move into the kingdom of God and find the straight path to God? That is the question. A common word between us and you is a global interfaith initiative that began as an open letter in October 2006. A common word between us and you proposes love of God and love of neighbor as the common ground between Christianity and Islam. A Christian response to the letter entitled, Loving God and Neighbor Together, a Christian response to a common word between us and you, was published in the New York Times. Some of those who endorsed the letter included megachurch pastor Bill Hybels, emergent leader Tony Jones, emergent leader Brian McLaren, self-esteem preacher Robert Schuler, and the purpose-driven pastor Rick Warren. The problem is that the document contains statements that allude to the false belief that Muslims and Christians worship the same God, that they share the same divine origin. The document states, it is hoped that this document will provide a common constitution for the many worthy organizations and individuals who are carrying out interfaith dialogue all over the world. Often these groups are unaware of each other and duplicate each other's efforts. Not only can a common word between us give them a starting point for cooperation and worldwide coordination, but it does so on the most solid theological ground possible, the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet and the commandments described by Jesus Christ in the Bible. Thus, despite their differences, Islam and Christianity not only share the same divine origin and the same Abrahamic heritage, but the same two greatest commandments. Both of these documents that were written, one the Muslims wrote first, and then you have the professing Christian response, is about unification and that we can only be one if we agree that we're worshiping the same God. In the summary of A Common Word Between Us and You, it states, The basis for this peace and understanding already exists. It is part of the very foundational principles of both faiths, love of the one God. The Christian response letter also refers to God of the Muslim tradition, as if the Muslims worship the same God as Christians. While Islam claims to worship one God, the response letter does not address the profound differences between the one God of the Bible and Allah. They signed the response that Yale Divinity School put back, which included uh, affirmation that Muhammad was the prophet. Since they did not refute the statement that the Bible and the Quran are both of divine origin, they were affirming that as well. I believe it's the greatest betrayal in the history of Christianity by professing Christian leaders. And what's really just tragic about this is the Quran nine different times denies, nine different times that Jesus is the Son of God. Denies it. Now how can you deny the incarnation, God in the flesh, and deny that Jesus is God and say that we have the same God? How can you deny that God is triune? deny Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and claim that we worship the same God. You really can't. And, and Muslims recognize, ultimately, that uh, we have to deny the Trinity. In fact, the common word document is based on a surah, a verse in the Quran, which states emphatically to make a common word between us and them, the Christians, that calls the people of the book, and get them to deny, or not to say that God is three, or that they're, God is triune. Now think about this. You're having Muslims write a document based upon a surah that joins them to go to Christians to get them to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, to deny the Trinity, to make a common word based on that surah. They call it a common word between us and you. Christians, professing Christians, write back, like Rick Warren and Brian McLaren, sign and agree that, hey, yeah, we all worship the same God, you know, i.e. loving God and neighbor together, meaning we're loving the same God. Therefore, we can hope to have world peace. And it's compromised in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though Christians may be in agreement with Muslims about finding common ground and not desiring strife, violence, and war, it is on the basis of the person of Jesus Christ that Christians do not kill. 
The love of God is uniquely expressed in Christ dying for our sins upon the cross and raising again, which Islam rejects. The Bible is clear that whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Muslims reject Jesus as the crucified and risen Son of God and Savior of the world. Therefore, Muslims are rejecting God. Christians and Muslims do not stand together on common ground or understanding of God or the love of God. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. While Jesus teaches to love one's enemies and be at peace with all men, Christians are not to set aside profound differences in the name of world peace. Any peace without Christ is futile in the scope of eternity. And we put all these things together and we realize that 1 John 2.22 identifies uh, Antichrist. And there are many Antichrists that have come and that will come again. But there's an ultimate Antichrist as well. Is a denial. That spirit is a denial of the Father and the Son. And again, this is the movement that we're witnessing before our very eyes. And we're seeing much of Christendom being swept up into it through the purpose-driven movement, through the emerging church movement, through the seeker-sensitive movement. Nobody denies the need for social reform, but it is a shameful compromise of the Great Commission to replace the gospel with social, economic, and political reforms. Warren's noble efforts for global reformation will bring wisdom, discipline, order, health, education, and security, but it will not bring life. Indeed, it will keep countless from God's kingdom by deluding them into rejoicing contentedly over a refreshing glass of old wine. They will believe they have found God, but will only have been brought closer to godly principles. There is no life in the mere influence of God, only in His presence. And that life requires death toward all that the world loves. There are many passages in the Word that clearly describe what the world's reaction will be to the gospel, and how we will be treated and regarded because of the gospel. The nature of Rick Warren's program and message is defined by how the world reacts to it. Warren is reaching people groups with information, organization, ideas, and even inspiration. His team is doing many good works in Jesus' name. The enemy is happy to have us doing good things, so long as we do them without the presence of God. We will all see on the last day who truly knows the Lord. Indeed, the church growth movement may gain the world by compromising the gospel. But Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. One more, one more, one more, one more. Right here, right here, right here. You know, I have a million followers between Twitter and Facebook, so you just got famous just now, you guys. All right, how many of you follow, follow Taffy on Twitter? Oh, you're sinners. How many of you follow uh, Pastor Josh? <laughs> if you're not following me on Twitter, you're going to hell. Okay, I'm sorry, that's, I just... I want you guys to know that, so it's in the Bible there somewhere, I know, I know for sure. at the whole religious scene today and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. 
And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house, a hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Whatever happened to anguish in the house of God? Whatever happened to anguish in the ministry? It's a word you don't hear in this pampered age. You don't hear it. Anguish means extreme pain and distress. The emotion so stirred that it becomes painful. Acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you or around you. Anguish, deep pain, deep sorrow, agony of God's heart. We've held on to our religious rhetoric in our revival talk, but we've become so passive. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. You search the scripture and you'll find that when God determined to recover a ruined situation, he would share his own anguish for what God saw happening to his church and to his people and he would find a praying man and he would take that man and literally baptize him in anguish. You find it in the book of Nehemiah. Jerusalem is in ruins. How is God going to deal with this? How is God going to restore the ruin? Now folks, look at me. Nehemiah was not a preacher. He was a career man. But this was a praying man. And God found a man who would not just have a flash of emotion, not just some great sudden burst of concern and then let it die. He said, no, I broke down and I wept and I mourned and I fasted. And then I began to pray night and day. Why didn't these other men, why didn't they have an answer? Why didn't God use them in restoration? Why didn't they have a word? Because there was no sign of anguish. No weeping. Not a word of prayer. It's all ruined. Does it matter to you today? Does it matter to you at all that God's spiritual Jerusalem, the church, is now married to the world? That there's such a coldness sweeping the land closer than that does it matter about the Jerusalem that's in our own hearts the sign of ruin that's slowly draining spiritual power and passion blind to lukewarmness blind to the mixture that's creeping in that's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it so you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Uh, let me ask you, is, is what I just said convicted you at all? There's a great difference between anguish and concern. Concern is something that, you, that begins to interest you. You take an interest in a project or a cause or a concern or a need. I'm going to tell you something I've learned over all my years, 50 years of preaching. If it is not born in anguish, if it has not been born by the Holy Spirit, where when you saw and heard of the ruin, it drove you to your knees. And all our projects, all our ministries, everything we do, where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know are not hearing and they're going to hell? You see, a true prayer life begins at the place of anguish, a place where lifetime decisions are made. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing His heart with you. You see, you, you, you either walk away and go back to your passivity and say, I'm just going to be an ordinary Christian and there's no such thing. Or 
Your heart begins to cry out, oh God, your name is being blasphemed. The Holy Spirit's being mocked. The enemy is out trying to destroy the testimony of the Lord's faithfulness and something has to be done. He can't go unchallenged. There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let him once again break us. Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. Please don't tell me. Don't tell me you're concerned. Don't tell me that you want your unsaved loved ones saved when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Come on. Lord, there's some need to get this altar and confess. I am not what I was. I am not where I'm supposed to be. God, I don't have your heart or your burden. I've been, I wanted it easy. Just want to be happy. But Lord, true joy comes. True joy comes out of anguish. There's nothing of the flesh will give you joy. I don't care how much money, I don't care what kind of new house there is. Absolutely nothing physical could give you joy. It's only what is accomplished by the Holy Spirit when you obey Him and take on His heart. And build the walls around your family. Build the walls around your own heart. Make you strong and impregnable against the enemy.